Okay, we have so much to talk about, 35 minutes. <laughs> Let's just start off with just the context. So Netflix, we know, in case you missed it, is the world's largest leading internet television network, over 65 million subscribers. You're in 50 countries. You, have 320, you had 320 hours of original content in 2015. And we know you for House of Cards and Orange is the New Black and Arrested Development. The interesting thing, in two years since you've released original content, 45 Emmy nominations, two Oscar nominations, 10 Golden Globe nominations. I mean, the investment business, the stock since it debuted in 2002 is up almost 10,000%. That's 82% a year. And just to give you some context, the S&P over this 13-year period has done about 5%. So it's killed it. <laughs> Brian Lord, Creative Artist Agency. Okay, so for this is not your father's talent agency. I mean, it's a whole new deal. Certainly not my father. You are <laughs> film, TV, music, sports, theater, video games. You represent people in design, the internet. You have everyone from Tom Hanks to Madonna to Riot Games. And you do everything from represent the 49ers on their uh, sponsorship of their stadium to helping Coke with marketing to um, helping to fund a, uh, a comedy website to helping with mobile apps. I mean, you've done, it's a big, vast organization. You got into sports in 2006. You went from zero agents to 150 today. You went from zero uh, sports figures that you represented to 800 today. Huge, huge organization. You've doubled in the last 10 years. So in many ways, both organizations are really not only at their best, but they're on a really clear and tremendous ascent. Now, a couple of personal things about you that I found interesting. Your first job was a page at CBS. Yes. You worked at a video store in a mall. <laughs> I did for a right? long time. Which makes a lot of sense for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're from Arizona. You're from the other LA, Louisiana. Yes. You, your current wife is a US, was a former US ambassador, and your ex-wife was a princess. <laughs> <laughs> Some people know what that means. Still is. Still is coming at Christmas time. You went to community college. You went to USC. I found that interesting because my husband went to both. You, one of you was called an evil genius. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to let them decide. <laughs> and the other one was called a little bit of Mother Teresa and a little bit of Tony Soprano. <laughs> but both of you are at, this epi at the epicenter of this major transition in media. So, Brian, first question to you. We talked on the phone. The title of this, con this panel is Which Way LA? The Business of Hollywood. And you started off by saying, I don't even know what Hollywood means. Explain. Well, it, it's like Silicon Valley means many things. Hollywood is, you know, actually a city in Los Angeles or a part of Los Angeles, but it's many, many different things. In the old days, it really represented studios and to some degree a couple of networks. And now it's this vast group of uh, people, artists, creators uh, that, are, that have ideas that are looking to figure out how to execute on their ideas and get to the biggest audience possible for the most part. And uh, it, it's just interesting to me what, what, it's nice what you said about our company. Um, and we feel like we're just getting started in many, many ways, but we were just responding to what was happening in the marketplace. So and it's, you reject the idea of Hollywood because it feels too small? It's too And so much of your growth is coming from other places? It implies something that's too central, a concept, like there's one little spot with a bunch of people doing the same thing, and it's not the case at all. R Riot Games is, two blocks from us and they're 14 acres and it's all gaming, it has nothing to do with movies or television, although it's about reaching an audience. It's the same with what Warner Brothers is and now Netflix and Amazon and YouTube and it's many, many different things. So what I found interesting is that he said Hollywood seemed to be a small descriptor for a big um, outcome and yet Netflix is based in Seattle but your business yeah, we're in Silicon Valley, we're Los Gatos. I'm sorry, in Seattle, yeah. Sil excuse me, yeah. Silicon Valley, I knew that. But your business, the other guys are in Seattle. Yeah. Your business <laughs> is in Hollywood, and you've taken more space recently. Yeah, no, we have, um, I, I agree with what Brian was saying, it's, it's interesting, you look at it, you're as likely to run into your Hollywood friends 
in New Orleans or uh, uh, Atlanta today as you would have ever before. You know, 20 years ago for sure, everything kind of was coming out of, out of. But you felt like you had to be in Hollywood and you're doubling your size in Hollywood. So, so I've been at Netflix for almost 15 years. And when I joined, I made a conscious decision not to move to Silicon Valley from LA. Uh, because, Why? Because I think the business still very much is a relationship business. And the people that, uh, it's a trust business, uh, people will hire people they know and people they trust and people aren't going to make them look foolish. And I think it's important in, those, in that world that you know the people you're dealing with, different, maybe differentially from other industries. I only know this because I've been around it, I've only been around this one. So if you're going to, your kids are going to school with the people you work with, and it, it, is, it is a company town in that way, and a lot of the decision making is super concentrated in Hollywood still, even though the, the production business and certainly the consumption of Hollywood is around the world. But a lot of those key decisions are still made right there in town. Do your and, friends... And I, that was, I didn't want to spend my life back and forth on a plane. So. Do your colleagues in Silicon Valley get the relationship part? Because I would think of Silicon Valley as actually not that relationship oriented. I, no, I don't know if they get it, but I, they stopped fighting it early. Uh, and I think it's been part of our success, which is that we have made a conscious effort to have one foot in Silicon Valley and one foot in Hollywood. And we really have, we have about 400 employees in the heart of Beverly Hills right now who do all aspects of our content creation, our content acquisitions, uh, um, the marketing and PR that's associated with it. That all takes place in LA. And we have about 1,600 people in Silicon Valley uh, they really focus on the product and making sure when you push play it works no matter where you are in the world, how fast your broadband is, um, and localizing the content, and localizing payment, and all those things that would they, we can't function without each other. Uh, and we think of it as, but we never look at it like, what, what's more important or what, uh, what should, would you choose? It'd be like when you're flying on a plane that has two engines, you're glad they have two engines. You know? <laughs> so Brian, let's just pretend, this happens to you all the time of course, but just for this discussion, you get the most amazing script on your desk. You represent the person behind this. You have to decide how to maximize the opportunity for this script. And let's do a couple of scenarios. <laughs> it's a tentpole movie. Okay. Who do you call? Uh, well, you, you, I guess to back all the way up, I have to read the script. First. No, you know this. No, you so, read it, and it's amazing. Uh, so so uh, you, you start with the old-fashioned idea of doing the work and, and trying to analyze where this project and this, this, the artist attached would thrive and, and maximize their audience, both financially and in terms of, of the reach, but also what the creative experience is going to be like and how they're going to work and where it's going to go. So you analyze what the distribution systems are that are available for it, and you make a decision with your clients and with my colleagues uh, where something belongs. If it's a, what we call a spec piece of material, which is completely un, uh, attached to a financing source, then it's fine because there's so many different distribution options available now that I can go to the town where do you and lean? sell it. Let's just assume that you I lean got to Ted. <laughs> no, no, no. Here. <laughs> no I, 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 it's, it's, uh, in my job, or in our jobs, uh, there, there are 1,005 people that work in our company now, and all of them interact with clients and make decisions about where their, uh, where their work should be. So my job is to know every person that is in the distribution system and what their strengths and weaknesses are and what their needs are and to try and marry those needs with my clients' needs. So do you need to be Switzerland? Uh, to some degree you do. Uh, at least you should start that way. It becomes clear as you go through the process where something belongs and who understands it and who really wants it. And I agree with Ted completely. It is a relationship business. There are filmmakers that trust uh, buyers or heads of you know, studios or you know, networks uh, and believe that they're going to take care of their project and sell it best and, and stick with them in the long run as things get hard and uh, uh, which because production is very very hard uh, and and it's it's about that trust so one other scenario a client you have a client they're doing a deal with Netflix right they can get paid in cash or 100% Netflix stock but not both what would you advise them <laughs> take the stock really no, no, I, I, I <laughs> uh, we're still a 10% business, so we need cash flow. So uh, just kidding. 
But uh, I, I think that, that it, 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 it's, a, it's a great company, and it showed up uh, and, and led in many ways this revolution that's going on for us to speak selfishly and for our clients in that there are more distribution uh, vehicles available than ever before. And I think the content is getting better as a result of it because I think... Do you think that's true? Because I do. some people say, when we talked on the phone, you said you're reading more than you've ever read before yeah. and you still have to kiss a lot of frogs. Yes, you do. You, but you, you really do. think there's better content now? I, I think that people would agree that, that there are more things on television that are more interesting than there have ever been before. And I think they're going to uh, niche audiences so my interests are answered in a way that they weren't before. And I think that's, that's a result of Ted and the gang at Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and what's coming with, with you know, a bunch of different companies. But I why do. then, Ted, are we seeing the same movie all the time? I, I, yeah, I mean, I how many cities have we seen destroyed by? Yeah, and, and how many guys in capes can come and fix it? Um, I, I think it's, it really is. I think in the movie business, it's, I think it's just evolving opposite of television, where those stories are getting smaller and, and more narrow, uh, but meant to just like, because it's just razzle-dazzle at that point, and people are just getting into a theater to escape. So it's all about the big explosions and all the things that you have to do. And the real intimate storytelling with really rich characters is being, are being made for the small screen on television. And I think if you're not into making you know, movies about destruction and superheroes, uh, you're probably writing for TV today. And a big part of it is because, as we all know, international so leads what the box office is. And what translated faster and easier were these types of movies. And for global, to, to travel for global, globally. Yeah, to, to travel globally. It, it's an interesting business Ted's in, in that he's buying movies and television shows specifically for territories to answer those territories and attract subscriptions. So you should talk about it more than me. But I, I think that movies and television and the definition of what those things were has, has to change. Because the, the, what used to be a movie was a two hour piece of film that was displayed uh, the, theatrically. And that's not necessarily true anymore. What, what television was, was you know, the, the network business and sports when that happened uh, on, on, on Saturdays and Sundays in Louisiana. Uh, it, it's, it's everywhere now, and it's just about time and where people spend their time. It's a, it's a, it's a whole different model. So you said... And, client, and artists think that way. They don't know what something is sometimes. I have a couple of situations now where they've got a long script, and they're debating whether they work to cut the script to get to a movie length, or they go to a four-hour in a long form because it, you can tell the story in a better way in some instances. So I want to go to the model, because you raised the point. So Ted, I read an interview where you said, network TV has nothing to worry about as it relates to Netflix, because they're, it's a different business. And I thought about it even after we talked a little bit, and I said, OK, let's think about network television's business model, which used to be 100% ad-based. Right. That's where the revenues came from. And now the retransmission fees are a very big part of the revenue stream from either cable operators or satellite operators. If people stream on Netflix, they do not get those retransmission fees. So if I'm an, a television executive, why am I not worried about you? Well, it, I think what the, the focus should be on is the consumer. And what's happening is the consumers are changing their, beha their behavior and habits. And it's gonna cre it creates a monetization challenge for television for sure. But it isn't a Netflix problem. It's, a, it's how, do, how, do, how are people behaving now? Every industry has to deal with changing consumer habits and changing consumer behaviors. This one is, uh, I'm not going to watch TV on your schedule anymore. I'm going to watch it on my schedule now. And I'm going to watch movies sometimes, and I'm going to watch series sometimes, and sometimes I'm going to watch five years of Breaking Bad in one weekend. <laughs> and, and, for me, and I think for the networks, what they have to figure out is how are they going to monetize that. The good thing is they are watching five years of Breaking Bad. They are watching the content that was made and produced by these companies, the same networks, the same studios, uh, are producing content for us too. So do you need networks to be successful? I mean, uh, in your business model, at the end of the day, does a healthy network system help you? Well, the, the, a healthy ecosystem of creation does. Um, how, where, how it's rooted, how its core monetization is rooted, I'm kind of indifferent to. I, I do think it's, um, there's an interesting model around the creation of movies and television that it really is still kind of swinging for the fences. 
So they lose money the, on a lot of things and make money on a few things, but they make enough money on the few things to make up. But at the end of the day, it turns out to be a 10% you know, return on investment business in any decade. And I do think that if you did things like the way in our monetization model, if you create for Netflix, um, on our movie side, we're producing basically at a profit. So we buy a movie uh, and the producers will actually profit at it at the beginning. Now, it, it isn't Titanic money, but these aren't Titanic. This isn't Avatar. These are movies that people really want to watch that are no longer getting made and no longer being put in theaters because that model doesn't work for the studios anymore. So I feel like we can make a lot of movies uh, where the producers always make a profit, like a real business, and that at the end of, the de at the end of a decade, they will have made the you know, double-digit returns instead of single-digit returns on, their business, on that business. So it's really just a shift in monetization to meet the changing needs of a consumer. So when you go back to the artist point, and you say the artist is trying to decide where to distribute, and again, we're back to the idea, let's say it's just a, a small independent film. Ted's argument is, I have a, you have a guarantee with us. You know you're going to make a profit. I don't have prints and ads that I have to spend money on, so I have right. a totally different kind of profitability. I'm going to have what he calls it the light touch uh, and have collaboration be invited. So I'm not going to ask you to see your dailies as a studio executive and tell you how to make your film. Yeah. So is this just a better world for the artist in general? Well, look, I think it's all an experiment. And, and I don't think anyone really knows where any of this goes and, and what effect Netflix is going to have on broadcast television. Broadcast television is healthy, and there are great examples, Empire being one, of real home runs, like home runs we haven't seen in a long time. So it, to Ted's point, if you give the audience what it wants, it, it shows up. I, I, I do think that, that artists, when they can control their material and develop it on their own uh, and, and then decide where something goes, it, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting moment in, in the evolution of all of this. We, we have an example that's, I think, a, you know, a good example of a Brad Pitt movie that Ted bought and is making that's uh, called War Machine, and, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's about uh, you know, the military industrial complex, and it's not the most obvious movie on, on, its, you know, on its read, but I love it, and Pitt loves it, and Ted loved it, and it's got, uh, uh, I think, a better chance of more people seeing it on Netflix globally than it would have had we gone the platform route, which is you know Friday in a couple of theaters, hoping to get perfect reviews, hoping to build an audience to get to a bigger release. And it, it was a decision Brad made to try and reach a bigger audience with what he was doing that's a little more aggressive and a little you know different than his normal fare. At the same time, he's going right back to Paramount and Brad Gray and for you know, two huge movies, one with Bob Zemeckis and the sequel to World War Z. And those movies belong there, all due respect. Fair. And, and they're, they're big, huge, global uh, films. But it's interesting. Part of the reason that, at least it seems to me, you bet on Brad Pitt is because he's a global superstar. Yeah. Two, you say you make data hunches. <laughs> so you're looking at a ton of data. Oh, we're here now, about, so get ready. <laughs> about Brad Pitt and about the content and what people want to see and just making a decision, which is almost yeah. scientific. I mean, there's a creative aspect to it, but yeah, there are algorithms around what you're doing. The things that we're doing with data are using it to size projects. So really, it's all I'm trying to figure out when we look at the viewing behavior is, what's the size of the potential universe for this film? And sometimes we differentially know that a lot of people will watch this movie. And against conventional wisdom, that a lot of people will want to see this movie. And, and the thing that I can't do is predict how it's going to come out. Right. Um, we, have a, we have the elements, right? You have all the, if you wanted to break it into data, you have a spreadsheet, right? You have all those elements that line in. But at the end of the day, nothing works, you know, because it worked in a spreadsheet. It works in that kismet that happens between an actor and a director, uh, or, a, a script and a, or a script writer and a director, uh, to make a great film. Uh, but sometimes, because there's been plenty of times where movies have got all of the great elements and just have been horrible. But, but what I'm trying to do is size out is, what is the size, what is the Brad Pitt audience on Netflix uh, in all the different flavors of what Brad Pitt might do? Um, and I think there are only a handful of global movie brands, and Brad Pitt is definitely one of them. Adam Sandler is another one. Um, where people, when you say an Despite Adam... Despite Pixels. Yeah, but Pixels was an enormous success. I, know, I don't know, the, the, the press uh, pickup on Pixels was that it did hor horribly. It was Adam Sandler's biggest international film of all time. 
um, and, and after 20 years of making movies. Uh, and the movie's done over $150 million internationally and over $100 million domestically. So you got a $250 million movie as a success. It used to be a success anyway. So. But part of the issue... And, and in other words, Adam Sandler has a huge audience, and what we know differentially is that it's growing around the world. He's just being discovered in Latin America, where right. there are 66 million broadband households, and Netflix is doing great. And okay, but here's the his, thing yeah. with, the, with Netflix. We don't know how these movies do. We don't know how these television shows do because you don't release any numbers. Right. And you say you don't release any numbers because you don't need to. You're not ad supported. So why should you release the numbers? You also say, which I thought was interesting, you thought HBO made a mistake in playing the numbers game in that they didn't need to do it. And they probably did it in order to trumpet their success. Yeah. So if I go back to just basic trying to understand the success of Netflix, and I'm an investor. I really have no transparency. I don't know how successful something is. And if I'm a movie star, and I'm Brad Pitt, and maybe I get some psychic value out of box office or yeah. knowing my number, new movie is number whatever of the year, yeah. that's gone. Yeah, I think it's been an interesting evolution. So what's great about what HBO, I do think that HBO made a mistake getting into the race, uh, but I don't think they've ever, I don't know that for sure that they've done anything bad with the information. So in other words, I But you think said that, ratings keep people from taking risks. I, I think it, they definitely do. I can't point to a place where they said, oh, the ratings were low on HBO, so they canceled something. So I, I don't know that that changed their behavior much. But I do think for us, I, what I don't want to do is have the ratings pressure on one show versus another that puts a bunch of creative pressure on a show to be something that it isn't, or that we pull the plug before it's fully realized. You know, Seinfeld took four years to connect with the public, and it's one of the greatest shows in television history today. Uh, James L. Brooks told me that it took three years for Mary Tyler Moore show to connect for him where he, before he thought it was a good show. So in today's environment, by the third airing, those shows would have been canceled. So I, what I don't want to do is get into this arms race about ratings, especially since it doesn't serve us at all. I mean, we don't sell ads. We don't have carriage fees. We're not negotiating channel position. You know, we're a direct-to-consumer business. And the way, if, as an investor, what you want to look at is, are they growing the business? So relative to how else they would spend the content dollars, um, are they growing viewing are they, and are they growing the, the business in total? In so the only numbers I could growth. really find, 10 billion hours of streaming yeah. in the first quarter of this year on Netflix. Yeah. 10 billion with 65 million subscribers, which was about 150 hours yeah. of television over that 90 day period. Yeah. And then watching about two hours a day, 1.7 hours. Yeah, on average, that's average, yeah. And the average person watches five hours. So you're saying you're going to grow that number. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that's what we're shooting for. We're trying to get a lot of watching on Netflix. So, and that, what, what's been great is the way people have reacted to our original programming is that a lot of, on any given day, um, uh, the majority of our top 10 most watched shows are Netflix series, seasons of Netflix original shows. Uh, which is great. I think people get very excited about it. And, and therefore, I don't know that it's important to put out a ratings number because when, you, when you're out to dinner and everyone's talking about Narcos, you know everyone's watching Narcos. So I don't, I don't, you don't, have to, I don't know that the, the exact number makes it anything more than trivia, uh, that that show is very successful. It's in the ethos. It's in the ecosystem. It's definitely, you know, you look at social media trends, and you could definitely see people watching Orange is the New Black and Narcos and Daredevil and House of Cards. They're, they're really our cultural events. I, I agree. I, I, that being said, I don't know how long they'll be able to get away with it. And <laughs> uh, I, 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 a fight's I, coming, you can tell. No, I, I, this, I, this is the Tony Soprano, not the other. I yeah, think that's well. actually a good point. <laughs> right, exactly. I, 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 there, there are competitors of Netflix that, that are uh, preparing to sell the idea of transparency. And, and for artists, which is the good news and the bad news, which they don't realize yet, but they will. Uh, the, the, the transparency is something they desire, you know, in a huge way. Because creative people are competitive. Well, and also starting with Hollywood accounting and how bad it is yeah. and that it was never transparent. So in people's minds, especially <coughs> artists, it's not just in Hollywood, but they're, they're, they've always been fighting against the establishment, the man, whatever it is. It's where their, you know, grind comes from that makes them great. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, we'll see how long this goes and what you know, Apple does and what other people do in terms of what information they share. Th th that being said, all the data in the world is only good uh, to a certain point, and then someone, a human, has to interpret it. Right. 
and has to figure out what it means and what the story is or what the content is that belongs next to this research and how to reach those people. And we all have examples of things that you, you read or you think. Mad Men, you know, famously, uh, I think it was the 67th buyer that they had a meeting with before Matt sold the show. And it, it transformed the network, as did Walking Dead, in a profound way. Uh, and those are just two humans with ideas. So what, in 10 years, does this all look like? Because you have a lot of competition coming in. So Apple TV, Amazon, you obviously have the traditional networks. You have HBO. You have a lot of people going for streaming, CBS, HBO. You're not doing sports. So if we unbundle and we go out of cart, and I'm a sports fan, I'm not saving money in the new world because I'm getting my NFL on CBS at $6 a month and I'm getting my, well, my, my ESPN for, Bob Iger says it could be as much as $30 a month. And I, this whole thing transforms into being something very different. What is it? I think, you know, I, I've, I've always thought that one thing that Netflix kind of did was bring some form of equilibrium to the entertainment business. Where I don't think there is a lot of equilibrium in the entertainment business, where sometimes they, where people just say my brand is a premium because I said so, and th therefore you pay a lot for your cable if you want my brand on your cable. Um, and I think the unbundling that will come, and I do think it will come, it won't come from, because of Netflix. It's going to come from the leagues. So when you can get MLB.com and you can get NBA.com with local games and the full lineup, that's going to drive a, a fundamental change in the TV business as we know it. I think in 10 years from now, and this is me thinking, is that it's going to be prime, almost entirely delivered on the internet because of the interactivity and the ability to merchandise and personalize. I think it's going to be a series of apps um, that, that it's closer to what you see on a smart TV today um, than, it is to, than it is to having a traditional cable bundle. Um, a lot of different people are going to play in the space because it's an enormous business. Um, but I don't, know, I don't think it's going to be delivered on cable, and I don't think it's going to be on, and that linear is going to have much to do with scripted programming. All of this choice, is it overwhelming the consumer? Yeah, I, I mean, I think on some level there is a, a paranoia now about not being up to speed or up to date on what things are. But uh, at, at the same time, I think people have always figured out how to spend their time and where they want to spend their time, and they tell us on the other side of the equation where it is and, and you answer it. And, and your 10-year question, I don't think, I, I have no idea. We haven't even talked about virtual reality or what will be invented in terms of what viewing experiences are or how people will go to theaters if they go to theaters and what, what, what the interaction will be in, in terms of real interaction with content. It's, it's no, I, don't, I don't think there's anyone to know. So there are two mics here. Ted, you said Theater donors are a little nervous of you because of day and date and a whole bunch of things. You said, I'm not anti-theater, I'm pro-movies. Yeah. If you were a theater owner today, you were running one of the big chains, what would you do? Um, I probably would do what they're doing and fight because... You would fight? Yeah, I, mean, they're, I don't think... Actually, what I would be doing, but while I was fighting... I would. Are they be, fighting a losing battle? No, but while I was having the fight, I would be investing heavily in that consumer experience. Um, making the seats more comfortable. Make, remember, I think fifth, in the 1950s and 60s, the studios did a lot to combat the novelty of television, but they're still not doing much to combat the quality of television. So make better movies that people want to see. But the theater owner doesn't make screens. the movie. What's that? The theater owner doesn't make the movie. No, but they have a lot of influence on what does get made and what gets booked. So there's a lot of great movies that just don't get booked. And sometimes it has a lot to do with business that, rather than the consumer. So right, right, immediately, Netflix is going to make a movie like Beast of No Nation. So it comes out in October. Um, it is in the, in, the, in the chatter for the Academy Awards, and people are having a debate as to whether or not it should because it is or isn't going to be in the theaters and how long it's going to be in theaters. It will, it will qualify for the Academy Awards. It will meet all the boxes that you need to, and people will have the opportunity to see that movie on a big screen. So there is no debate that it's a movie, and it's an Oscar-worthy movie, and, but, but yet theater owners immediately, their first reaction was we don't want to book it. So we did, a great, we did a deal with Landmark to put it in other theaters across the country, uh, but Regal and AMC and others have come out and their first reaction was, we're not going to book it. Well, if, if we're making movies that, are, that people want to see and they're not booking them, I don't think that's good for their business. So I, what I'm trying to do is make the movie business bigger. Now, the theaters, the, the in-theater viewing might shrink a little bit, but the overall business of movie watching and movie making will, will grow for sure. So be, well, that will be one to watch. Yeah. Question here. Hi, I'm Manu. I'm a junior at Stanford. Uh, I read this somewhere, probably in Business Standard, uh, Kevin Spacey talking about how you guys are creating personalized trailers for House of Cards. 
So if I go back and watch Frank Underwood kind of speak a lot, my trailer would have him speaking a lot more than other person's trailers. Uh, I wanted to go into her algorithms questions and think about have you thought about algorithms in my personal viewing habits deciding the content? So if I'm watching 50 minutes of House of Cards and I just like watching Frank Underwood a lot more than other people, uh, I have like three more minutes for him than other people or something like that. Thank you. Right. So I, like I said, we use the data to figure out how many of you are out there. So um, a lot, there's a lot of people that just love Kevin Spacey and will watch him almost anything. Um, and we, to do that, we had to figure out, well, it's, it's fig pretty easy to figure out what it's like to see Kevin Spacey in an enormous big movie. Everyone wants to see that movie. But if, what about his movies that didn't do as well, but still had Kevin Spacey and still had great viewing? And that's a movie like The, the Big Kahuna, um, which is, you know, but people who love Kevin Spacey also love that movie. So you, you, do, you crunch all these numbers, you get all these concentric circles, and you realize that you have this political thriller set in DC with a big star, with David Fincher directing, and you can really get a, a feel that that could be a very big show. And that, we don't use the data beyond that. Here. Hi, I'm, I'm Jonathan Taplin. I'm the director of the USC Annenberg Innovation Lab, and also the proud father of the producer of Beast of No Nation. But, <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, John Landgraf, the president of FX, recently said there's too much damn television. <laughs> that there were, used to be 200 new dramatic series a year, and now there's 450. Uh, do either of you think that we get to a place where the great notion of scarcity, which seemed to bring value to creative content, goes away completely, and, and we make the audience so diverse and so niche that we, we make a big mistake? Especially in the context, just an add-on, and I think that's a great question, to the fact that a lot of that new programming is reality-based. Yeah, I, I think... No, he was just talking about dramatic series. That's just, Not even that's right just scripted series. I, I, look, I, I think it's a very unusual comment to make when you're producing content. Uh, and, and actually, FX Studios is making content for Amazon. So you, in other words, if you really think there's too much TV, you stop making so much. Uh, I don't think it's true. I think, there's, I, think, I think that we have the ability to serve a really ver a vast variety of taste and unique taste. And to somebody who really loves House of Cards, they may not care about what had American Summer. And people who love what had American Summer, some of them don't care at all about House of Cards. Uh, so really, is a, is a, if you can make it on, the sca on scale to, to, to perform for an audience uh, and make it at, high, at very high quality, I, I don't, this debate about the quality of television is interesting to me too, Ren. I mean, there was a time when on Thursday night you had uh, uh, Mash and Mary Tyler Moore, all in the family, all on the same night. And, and now, I think, like I said, now, but now we have 450 shows. They're all over the place. They're geared to different audiences. You can watch them whenever you want. It's not three hours of prime time, five nights a week anymore. So um, I, I'd say there's too much television when the quality of television d dramatically erodes. I don't think the quality of television has dramatically eroded. I think, it's, I think it's, uh, there are some things that are not as good as they were in the 80s and some things that are light years better. But it's also subjective. And, and I think to, to m call it all television, just with the big, broad sense of the definition of television, is a mistake, and, and it's, it's, it's an old way of thinking. There are dedicated people to The Real Housewives and to Andy Cohen, and he delivers a number uh, on that, that nightly talk show that's in the twos that competes with most of the people that you think of as mainstream talk show hosts. And it's just, but he just happens to deliver the same woman <coughs> and crazy gay people that I'm maybe sort of considered one of uh, <laughs> every single night. And, and I, I think that that can be uh, demonstrated across all you know, categories now. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Sarandos, Brian Lord, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.